Camera's kind of dark today, but uh, that's okay. Let me do the attendance. Populi. Sam, are you back there, Sam? Sam, he was in my class this morning. So you think you got it bad. He had me twice today. Isaiah. Everybody's very dark in there today. I don't know what's going on. Morgan, I see Morgan. Stephanie, I have seen Stephanie several times today. Some very close-ups of Stephanie. Adam. Audrey. Aaron. Liga. Hello. Hello. Isaiah. Cody Heck. Good to see you. Bruce Heller. Hello. Quincy James. No Quincy today? Jordan. I don't see Jordan. No Jordan today. Jackson. No Jackson today. Brendan. Jocelyn. I don't see Jocelyn today. Caleb Nolan. I know he can't be there because I don't hear him. Rebecca Peterson. No. No Rebecca. Caleb Runyon. Caleb Runyon, not there. David Sanchez. Jonathan Sanchez. No. Sean. Hannah to uh, Tomes. Tombs. Hannah, you there? No. Missing Hannah, Jonathan, Caleb, Rebecca, the other Caleb, Jocelyn, Jackson, Jordan, Quincy, Isaiah. Okay, that's a lot of people we're missing today. All right. Let me go to the PowerPoint here. Let me share a few more things with you as we finish things out. Remember, this is our last uh, class session. I know. Crying. I'll send you virtual uh, tissues. Uh, and don't, don't forget, we still have things due this week and next week. You can get it all done this week if you are so inclined. Let me share with you uh, what we were talking about last time and kind of finish this out. Okay, good, good, good. So we were looking at some of the divisions, some of the problems that were faced in the 20th century. Remember, we talked about that. Instrumental music, liberalism, open membership. We talked about the instruments. We had the cowbell, we had Elvis, uh, the pros and cons of instruments. Uh, there have been attempts to reconcile the two groups, you know, since they divided or officially were listed as being divided, 1906, now it's been a hundred and almost 120 years, not quite. But occasionally there are uh, <coughs> unity meetings that try to bring back together sort of the three groups. You've got the non-instrumentalist, you've got the disciples of Christ, and you've got the sort of independent Christian churches. Uh, Jim Murch did some of these. Carl Ketcherside. Don DeWelt, you may have heard of him. He was often affiliated with Ozark. And uh, these union, union, unity forums, you know, still have meetings. They have some limited success. There have been projects people have done together. They've invited non-instrumental guys to speak when they used to have the North American Christian Convention. They've done a set of commentaries together, that sort of thing. Uh, so there has been some, some limited success, I guess I would say. Now let's take a look at liberalism. Liberalism's growing in the 19th century. It's not only 
not only with the, um, I see we're zooming back from uh, Stephanie. So liberalism is growing in all Christian circles in the 19th century. Certainly it affects the Restoration Movement. One of these things is Darwinism. Darwinism. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. We've got kind of a dance going on in front of the camera. I'm waiting for the charger. It's going to die. Well, okay, you better charge it up. Yeah, everything's dark. I don't know what that means. It's darker than normal. But that's all right. So, Darwinism, or the theory of evolution, of course, has brought about problems. And uh, so people who, some people begin to doubt the Bible because they're following science and Darwin. There's also higher criticism of the Bible. This higher criticism is saying basically the Bible is not true and that the Bible has multiple sources, but they're all human sources. It's not divinely inspired. So the main thing is seeing the Bible as a human book rather than a book of uh, divine origin. They also then begin to see Christianity as just one of many religions, not a unique religion. Okay, so this kind of liberalism is growing in the 19th century, primarily in Europe, but these ideas then are being brought to the good old U.S. of A. What are some of the uh, teachings of liberalism? Basically, they deny miracles. Miracles are rejected out of hand. So with that are all the teachings of the Bible that have miracles involved. Virgin birth, for example. Bodily resurrection of Christ, for example. Uh, they don't believe that Christ is divine. They believe that he is uh, a great teacher. Uh, they're saying also that the church is just sort of a human institution that needs to evolve and that it's not somehow a special divine organization or the body of Christ. Um, social gospel is promoted. Anybody here know what social gospel is? You ever heard that term, social gospel? Morgan, what's the social gospel? The social gospel is where evangelical preaching and evangelical gospel. Social gospel is where evangelical Okay. The social gospel takes the gospel and basically uh, sort of removes the idea of sin from it. Sin is not what we would say that is breaking God's rules. Sin is basically poverty, ignorance. So how do we solve sin? Education and redistribution of money. Social gospel also teaches that everyone is basically good. Everyone is good. So the real key to the social gospel then is that we recognize everyone is good and we just give them more education. If they receive more education, they will live a life that is more in harmony with society and, of course, they don't have enough money, then we give it to them by basically having the government take it away from certain people and give it to other people in various welfare or social programming. Okay? 
So you can also see that the social gospel focuses on society and not sin. An interesting uh, illustration of social gospel, I guess, would be In His Steps. This is a book published now about 120 years ago. And it was actually published uh, sort of incorrectly without good copyright. So this book has been published and republished because you don't have to pay any copyright for it. Consequently, I've seen it for sale even now for like $1.96 a copy. Uh, I've used it before to have people read it as a, an example. Charles Sheldon. You might have seen this bumper sticker. WWJD. What does WWJD stand for? What would Jesus do? Yes, what would Jesus do? Uh, this is um, basically from this book. The guy uh, starts off his story. It's a guy getting his sermon ready, and he keeps getting interrupted, and this guy comes to the, to the door wanting help, wanting to talk to him, and so on. And so finally, the minister gets up, and he just starts to say, okay, I just want us to try living our lives here for the next uh, several months just by asking ourselves this question, what would Jesus do? Anytime you have a decision to make, just ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And then try to do it that way. So social gospel also, like you said, focuses on labor unions, <coughs> social justice, prohibition of liquor, trying to keep liquor out of the hands of people who might drink alcohol and uh, get inebriated. Um, and it began to tie together salvation and good works. So instead of a salvation by, uh, by grace through faith, through faith by grace, it's more, well, if you don't do it, then you don't have it. So they argued people should emulate the life of Jesus. Liberalism begins to move to colleges in Europe in the 19th century, and of course soon it will come to colleges and universities in America. By the way, all those Ivy League schools that you hear about, Harvard, Yale, Brown, I don't know, any of those, Dartmouth, they all began as places to prepare ministers. They were minister training centers. Uh, of course, they've gone pretty far afield from that today. But a, a University of Chicago becomes a, a real center of uh, liberalism as well. And we see that many ministers and begin to spread this throughout the churches after they receive this training. This influence then goes to the congregations. And so we, this is how liberalism will spread. Now what about the Restoration Movement? Where does this happen? Primarily we can see it centered around the city of Chicago and the University of Chicago and the, what is called the Disciples Divinity House at UC, or the University of Chicago, which begins in 1894. The Campbell Institute begins in 1896. Uh, publications like the Christian Century, previously called the Christian Oracle, these spread the idea of liberalism. Colleges were then staffed by professors that were trained in this kind of thinking. For example, in Lexington, Kentucky, as you see on the map there, Lexington, Kentucky, uh, College of the Bible, once a very conservative school, became quite liberal, and eventually the movement, that is uh, the Restoration Movement, will divide into two camps, liberal and conservative theologically speaking.
So when these schools get quite liberal, what happens? Well, guess what? People start new schools. What kind of new schools, you say? Primarily what's known as the Bible College Movement. Now, Bible College Movement was nationwide, affected a lot of groups, including the Restoration Movement. They formed to be a conservative alternative for minister training. The earliest Bible colleges in the Restoration Movement were, say, from 1890 to about 1920. And there's a few examples there. The earliest one is Johnson Bible College, now called Johnson University. It was started by Ashley Johnson in the hills of Tennessee, Okay, before the computer there died, uh, we were talking about the Bible College movement and how it's a conservative reaction to train ministers. The first one was Johnson Bible College, started by Ashley Johnson, basically on his farm, and it's still there today near Knoxville, Tennessee. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, others like Minnesota Bible College, later called Crossroads College, now defunct, no longer exists. They kind of merged it with HIU, their hope. Uh, Kentucky Christian College, now con called Kentucky Christian University, 1919, still in business. Cincinnati Bible College started in 1924, later Cincinnati Christian University, now defunct. You might have heard about them. They've somewhat come under the central Christian college, oh, the Bible umbrella, although not a merger for legal purposes. Manhattan Christian College, ever heard of them? Manhattan, Kansas. Pacific Christian, it used to be called Pacific Bible Seminary or something like that. Now, then it's Pacific Christian College. Now it's Hope International University. Hi, you! Started in 19 and 28. Still going. I put a couple logos up here some of you might recognize. Central Christian College, O the Bible, and St. Louis, or St. Louis Christian College. In the 1930s, they started Atlanta Christian College, now called Point University, still in business. San Jose Bible College, later called William Jessup University, now I think they just call it Jessup University, out in California. In the 1940s and 50s, here's some names you might recognize. Boise Bible College, Colegio Biblico, Great Lakes, Lincoln Christian, Louisville Bible College, Midwest Christian College, defunct, kind of merged with Ozark. Uh, Nebraska Christian College, I believe now defunct. Ozark. Uh, it used to be called Ozark Bible College when it merged with Midwest Christian College in 1985. They changed their name to Ozark Christian College. Defunct, no, not defunct. Roanoke Bible College, now called Mid-Atlantic Mid Mid Christian University, not defunct. Dallas Christian College, not defunct. Puget Sound, defunct. That was up in uh, Washington State. 1950s and 60s, Central Christian, College O, the Bible, Eastern Christian College, defunct, Mid-South Christian College, I think it's still hanging on, St. Louis Christian College, 
defunct, merged with Central. Platte Valley, now Summit Christian College. I don't know if that one's still around. Florida Christian College, basically defunct, but was merged in with Johnson University, now called Johnson, Florida. We'll see how long it survives. So you can see we got an awful lot. This isn't even all of them. A lot of these colleges, guess what? Every one of those colleges has a uh, president. Every one of them has a kind of library, has some vehicles, has some sports teams, has some professors, has some kind of buildings. Um, so we spend a lot of money on colleges. Somebody might say, well, why don't we merge some of those colleges? Why do we have so many? Uh, it might be more efficient if we did. Well, maybe it would be, but guess what? Since we are not a denomination, there's nobody that's going to say this, this particular college is going to shut down. The only thing that's going to say that college is going to shut down is if they don't have enough money, if they go bankrupt or have some financial big problems. So... Uh, consequently, we still have scores of colleges, most of them relatively small. Why are they dying? Why are they defunct? Yeah. That's a good question. I would say they, they are defunct because uh, it's very difficult and expensive thing to run to college. I would say the climate has changed, let's say, since the 1980s, 1990s, you know, over the last 30, 40 years. It used to be, here's the way it used to be back in what I call, as you guys call it, back in the day, which I never know what that means. But the way it used to be, churches would have youth groups. Do churches still have youth groups? I suppose they do. And one of the things that every youth group would do would be to go visit Bible colleges in the spring. The youth minister would get the bus, the van, the vans, would load in all the youth group, and they would go to four or five Bible colleges and come on their campus and visit them and meet the students and meet the professors and decide which school they wanted to go to. I don't think that happens much anymore. Did any of you, when you were in a youth group, have a youth minister that took you around in a van to different Christian colleges? One? What's that? My dad was a youth minister and our pastor, and he took our youth group to a few different places, and we came and toured Central, and we came to Florida State. Okay. Anybody else in the room have that happen? That used to be very, very common, and the churches really supported the colleges. So usually a church was closely affiliated with at least one or maybe two colleges, something like that, and they would really encourage their young people to go there. I don't think that happens that much anymore. Maybe some. Do you think churches are, like, not doing as well either? Well, I think churches are, churches, a lot of them don't see the Bible college as essential as they used to for providing ministers. That's, well, that's my impression. I don't have any stats, but I would say also a lot of, a lot of churches used to go to the colleges and ask them, oh, we need a new youth minister. So they would contact people at Central and say, you got anybody there? It's a good student that could be a youth minister for us here at Big Shot Christian Church in Big Shot, Missouri. Uh, I don't think that happens as much either anymore. Uh, well, you know, it's it's tough for the Bible. Yeah, I, it, yes, the Bible colleges need to try to get more people to come, but they also need help. They need help from the congregations, and I don't think I don't think congregations support the colleges as much as they used to. Well, I think they've tried, and yeah, they still need to do that. I'm just saying that since churches don't 
support the colleges as much. Colleges have begun to look elsewhere for students. Where are colleges looking for? Well, they start a lot of sports teams and recruit people to play sports who may or may not have a church connection. Uh, they start to offer a wide variety of programs thinking that will get people to come, which are more expensive perhaps to run some of those programs. Everybody's frozen now. I don't know what's going on. Can you hear me? I can't, I can't hear you. They would know a lot more about it than I. Well, let me uh, let me tell you that we've had a couple of colleges up in Canada. Maritime, which is up at Prince Edward Island. Alberta Bible College. I'm not sure of the status of those two right now. We've got a couple just for African-American students. Uh, although, you know, other people too, but primarily set up for African-Americans. One in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It used to be called Winston-Salem uh, Bible College, now it's known as Carolina Christian College, um, and College of the Scriptures in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, three graduate schools still in existence, well, not anymore. Cincinnati Bible Seminary or Cincinnati Christian University had a graduate program, that's where I went to school. Defunct. Lincoln Christian College and called Lincoln Christian University. Still has a graduate program. They have made some major changes in the past year, so we'll see what happens there. Emmanuel School of Religion, uh, they had to make some major changes financially. They've now merged with Milligan College, but they're still in business. So we still have two schools still in business for Masters of Divinity, although other schools have started some graduate programs like Central, and uh, Ozark and Johnson and some others, but not having a full-blown seminary. What are some other conservative things that have come up to try to promote evangelism? Uh, basically, new missions uh, approach called direct support missions, where missionaries go out and raise their own money going to churches and individuals because... There were liberals in control of mission organizations. New periodicals that started because of this, Christian Standard, which is still in business, Restoration Herald. The North American Christian Convention began in 1927, defunct. It ended in 2018, and now they call it something like, I don't know what they call it, they got some other name for it. But it used to be a convention for everybody. Now it's just kind of a minister's, leader's thing called Spire or something like that. The National Missionary Convention, now called ICOM, still going strong. Centered in Indiana Place, Indiana. How about Christian service camps? Have you ever been to one of those? Like a Christian assembly, Christian service camp? I saw one there in Moberly. They called it, what was it, White Oak Christian Camp? You ever heard of that? Well, anyway, those start to basically recruit young people into Christian service. That's why they were called Christian service camps. Thousands go every summer. And, uh, you know, high school primary school, middle school. The focus is on evangelism. The focus is on trying to get students to commit to Christian service, being a missionary, being a minister, something of that lines. So those are alive and well. And then, of course, our final thing is the... Uh, Open membership that we've already talked about. Open membership is basically 
what do you do when somebody comes forward and they want to join your congregation? Um, usually non-Christians, that is the unimmersed, would be required to be immersed. Others who are transferring, who have been immersed, would be allowed in. L. L. Pinkerton advocated open membership, which would just mainly accept anyone who wanted to join the congregation. Pretty, pretty wild, uh, widely practiced by the middle of the 20th century in some groups. Today, I... I don't know. Today, I would say it's it's perhaps practice, but uh, I don't have good numbers on it. So we see then, we end up with three groups. Struggle over the music leads to a division between those who use instruments and those don't, 1906. Struggle over liberalism. Theological liberalism will lead to the formation of the Disciples of Christ as a denomination in 1956. By the way, that led to court battles, especially in the state of Indiana, where basically the Disciples of Christ said they were going to form a denomination, and they said that all the church buildings and all of the church property belonged to them. And so this went to the Supreme Court of Indiana, there were a lot of court fights over it until finally the Supreme Court of Indiana said each congregation gets to decide whether they want to join this new denomination and it doesn't automatically do that. And so this is why you find sometimes uh, two Christian churches in a town, one of them uh, is Disciples of Christ and one of them is not. This also means a lot of the colleges went, uh, a lot of the colleges went to them as well. Had to try to quiet my hound. Uh, and so this is why a lot of Bible colleges get started as well at this time because the other colleges, for example, Butler University used to be a Christian, it's a disciples school, Eureka College, Hiram College, all these went to the disciples of Christ and so other colleges were started. All right, so we end up now with three groups, a, a group that's for unity, unfortunately does not stay unified it cannot weather uh, things like instrumental music, liberalism, and so forth. And we see uh, three groups now. Non-instrumental, usually called Church of Christ. The uh, more theologically liberal, typically called Disciples of Christ. And their churches labeled Christian churches. And then a group in the middle of which Central is affiliated which would typically be called Christian churches, although sometimes called churches of Christ, but they use instruments. So this is it. Okay, now...